In Washington, D.C., the reward for a fugitive homicide suspect who escaped in a hospital has a massive increase. In Georgia, a man suspected of murder is shot by a man defending his family during a home invasion. And in New York, a daycare falls victim to the rising fentanyl crisis. These stories and more coming at you today, Thursday, September 21st, on Real Life Real Crime Daily. And I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Overton. And I'm Mike Agavino. Happy Thursday, folks. Thirsty. Thirsty, thirsty, thirsty. Thursday. And I'm excited to watch my Giants kick the crap out of the 49ers tonight. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm fantasy and hard for the 49ers, uh, but I do have to pick you know at least one Giants player. But it, it, it'd be a good game. <laughs> Tell you everybody again, we're, we're recording remotely in the system. Um, I'm in. I don't know, I'm not going to tell you where I'm at. The, the I'm a, uh, in a city recording, and I've got to be gone in just a few minutes for cold case files. Uh, so that's exciting for real life for crime and all you lifers it wouldn't happen without y'all. So I, I want to thank you. And on the last show, I uh, didn't get to close out. I will uh, thank all y'all tell you, we love you. Please continue to like and share with everyone. And um, that's it. So, all right, well, we're going to get into some crime time then. And we're going to tell you about a man accused of killing an elderly woman in Ohio was recovering Friday at a Georgia hospital after he was shot twice during a home invasion. Michael Brooks, the second 28 of Columbus will face charges of home invasion, burglary and theft by receiving in Georgia and murder charges in Ohio upon his release from that hospital. 911 received a call just before 2 a.m. on Thursday of last week uh, from a resident about a possible intruder. At the same time, the agency received a notice from an alarm company for that resident. The homeowner, armed with a gun, confronted the intruder who had a knife in the basement. Deputy said the homeowner warned the intruder before shooting him. The homeowner then left the basement and took up a position on the second floor staircase to protect his family. There, he took a stand as the subject made his way up to the second floor. He made the comment uh, to the effect of, you're going to have to kill me. When the resident fired a second shot, that was about the same time deputies got there. From what we can tell, he was coming down the stairway with a second gunshot wound, this from the sheriff. At that point, they actually still struggled with him as they took him into custody. Investigators were able to tie Brooks to a deadly home invasion six days earlier through a red Ford F-150 that was taken from Kettering, Ohio. The home invasion appears to be random. The sheriff also said it could have been anyone's home he entered. He had apparently tried a couple of others in the neighborhood, and the sheriff described those neighborhoods as upscale. The Columbus Division of Police identified Brooks as a man responsible for the deadly stabbing of a 77-year-old woman in Columbus University's district on September 9th, and investigators said that Brooks did not know that victim. Investigators were able to identify Brooks for that murder through forensic evidence collected at the home and obtained murder warrants for him on Wednesday. So... Homeowner defending his family, uh, kind of a good story right. here on, on real life. Real life. Yeah, it's, it's good always guys. good. Crazy. Yep. Score one for the good guys. Yeah. Absolutely. So. And the fact that they were able to tie him to that other murder from yep. from forensic evidence on the second scene is is even you know icing on the cake. Right. Double up. Score one for the good guys, not just the homeowners, but the cops. Uh, doing a good, a good job on that too. So that's interesting, but take you to Ago's favorite city, Philly. Now, I go, did you see that somebody really put you on blast uh, that, that was from Philly the other day? Somebody, a lifer made a comment that, uh, about you and hating Philly people, but it, I guess if you're from Philly, that's 
what you do, right? Yeah, but yeah, but unfortunately, for, for the, unfortunately for them, every day the news vindicates my position. Well, I'm about to I'm about to vindicate it a little bit more. So we're going to Philly, where a reckless driver shut down a busy intersection in South Philadelphia to perform dangerous, illegal stunts, and yet another street takeover plaguing the city of brotherly love. Cell phone footage captured the moment a group of cars were performing donuts, herringly close to spectator Saturday at 2.30 a.m. The pedestrians could be seen running to dodge the circling vehicles while others stood in the middle of the swerving cars, appearing to record the fast-paced action. At one point, a person could even be seen hanging out of one of the cars as it performed a high-speed donut in the intersection. Too bad they didn't fall out, right? But in the scariest part, in one of the videos, uh, uh, was a green car that did so many donuts that it went out of control and almost went over towards Target. Uh, uh, Rhonda Walker told CBS News of the, stri- of the street takeover she recorded from her condo. And the whole crowd was just like pushed away, Walker said. She was awoken by the screeching tires and looked out to see hundreds of kids blocking the intersection and sticking dangerously close to cars. Walker added that officers at the scene had trouble breaking up the crowd and trying to stop the cars circling around them. Philadelphia police have yet to list any arrests in relation to Saturday's incident, and street takeovers have become an increasing problem in large cities across the nation in recent years with wannabe stunt drivers performing dangerous tricks in their vehicles in the middle of the road. While the popularity of such stunts soared during the pandemic, when few drivers were out and about, the take- takeovers continued to persist, particularly in Los Angeles, where officials have been tracking such incidents. But yeah, it's, it, it's everywhere. It happened in Baton Rouge, you know, uh, several times recently, and they finally started cracking down on them. That's just crazy. It's, I don't, I, yeah, it's, it, it's going to take one of them getting killed. I. It'd probably make it more popular if that asshole would have fell out of the car and got run over. But the, you're, you know, I don't know. They need to throw the book at these dudes and, and girls and, and lock them up. Yeah, and they've had a lot of issues uh, in Louisiana, Baton Rouge, with uh, the street racers and, and uh, you know, drifters. Or, uh, drifting, I think, is what they call right. it when they're, when they're spinning these right. cars and uh, – yeah. It's just hey, if you're doing the before war, and if you start doing a donut circle around me, to you're almost running me over. I'm gonna pump your car full of lead, and I'm gonna shoot you. All right. I mean, that's that's a that's, right. that's a legitimate thing, right? I mean, your life's in danger. Shoot him. So be like the first story. Be one for the good guys. That's a that's a fair warning, Woody. I think you should just hang a sign that says that on your car. Right, I'm, I'm gonna get some shirts made, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah, please do donuts around me, and and I will put a hole in you. Right <laughs> there, you go. You guys, big fans of rodents. Right. How do we feel about rodents? Rodents? I'm not a now, fan. But, but it depends on kind of what rodent you're talking about. How I about mean, a, how, yeah, about my, big, my, big, how about a big hairy rat? All right, well. No. Not, not, no. Gonna, gonna kill it. Not gonna eat that a, one either. How about a big hairy rat that you see through the window of the bar restaurant you're about to go into? Um, uh, I wouldn't even go in the restaurant. Probably not yeah. going. Probably not gonna go in. <laughs> and how about if it's if it's actually standing right next to the uh, the grade A health inspection sign? <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. can only happen in, it, only happen in New York City. So real life, right. real life ratatouille. Um, a plump and plucky rat was spotted scurrying around the windowsill of a downtown Manhattan bar restaurant, right next to a successful health inspection sign with the top grade of A. The large rodent could be seen in a TikTok shared online Saturday night that showed the animals scampering around the front window of Dixon Place. A fully a theater with Dixon. a fully equipped bar and kitchen. Although the furry fiend was surrounded by rat droppings at, at the Christie Street establishment, 
The business still boasted the top passing grade for sanitary conditions by the New York City Health Department. In the TikTok, which was aptly set to Le Festine from the Ratatouille soundtrack, a woman can be seen tapping the glass to see if the rat would move. The rat's tail quickly flicks back and forth as the creature scurries behind the sanitation sign before reappearing on the other side of the window. Uh, the TikTok is pretty funny. We'll post it so you can see it. Several people filming the creature can be seen in the window reflection. All the commotion outside appeared to startle the rat, which then bounded into a potted plant on the floor before disappearing. Some TikTok users found humor in the ironic sighting, joking, that's the chef, and that's just Ratatouille, dude. He's chill. But rodent infestations are no laughing matter to Mayor Eric Adams, who appointed a rat czar to tackle the persistent pests in Manhattan, where rats have been running rampant. Though the rats may be a spectacle of sorts for some, including tourists taking a, believe it or not, this is real, a special late night sightseeing route past rodent infested areas. I wonder what they charge for, uh, for that tour. City officials have created new garbage policies and an interactive rat informational portal or rat map to try and stifle the growing rat population. Officials have lauded their latest efforts, claiming reports of rat sightings are actually down. Before the city began to wage its campaign against the critters, from January to April, New Yorkers called 311 to report 7,400 rat sightings, up from an estimated 6,500 during the same period the year before. The New York City Department of Health has responded to the public outcry as a result of the viral video and will be conducting an immediate inspection of the venue. So they had just conducted that inspection, given the place a grade A, and, uh, uh, and then they have a rat performing in the window for the folks about to enter. Hey, y'all. Changing my wardrobe from summer to fall, it's never easy. Luckily, Quince offers timeless and high-quality items I adore. Ensure my wardrobe stays fresh and I don't blow my budget. And there's nothing easier than going to Quince and choosing these high-quality items, like cashmere sweaters from $50, pants for every occasion, washable silk tops, and so much more. The best part? All Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman, the passes and savings on to us. And Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes, and I love that. I got the stainless steel Link Apple Watch band from $59.90. It, it's heavy duty, it's awesome, and it's like $100 less than I could find anywhere else. And I also got a 100% organic Cotton Fisherman quarter zip-up sweater. The color is alabaster. Man, I can't wait to wear that this fall. And Cindy got the Mongolian cashmere boat neck sweater in Heather Gray. And I'm telling you, these are classic pieces at a fraction of the price. Make switching seasons a breeze with Quince's high-quality closet essentials. Go to quince.com slash R-L-R-C for free shipping on your order and 365-day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash R-L-R-C to get free shipping and 365-day returns. Quince.com slash R-L-R-C. You'll thank me later. Spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Gifts to spark joy, wonder, delight, and that's exactly what I want it feeling. Hey, y'all, I ordered a super cool piece. It's a candle with a sculpture of LSU Tiger Stadium on top of it. And each officially licensed laser-cut wooden replica features up to four layers of detail, creating a bird's-eye view of a specific football field, seating section, and more. And every label includes your stadium's name, the team's logo, and school location. And it has a coconut, soy, vegan wax infused with sandalwood smell that creates tailgates and touchdowns scent profile, reminiscent of game day. It's invigorating like fresh-cut grass and nostalgic like smoke from a pre-game grill. In common, like the crisp autumn air of a new semester on campus. Y'all, I love it. I have it at the base of my TV, and I'm ready to watch the Tigers play on Saturday night, right? 
Uncommon Goods. Look, when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. And many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. Uncommon Goods looks for products that are high quality, unique, and often handmade or made in the U.S. They have the most meaningful out of the ordinary gifts anywhere. They even have gifts you can personalize. From holiday hosts and hostess gifts to the coolest finds for kids, to hits for everyone from the book lovers to diehard sports fans, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone, not the same old selection you can just find anywhere. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. So to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C. That's uncommongoods.com slash R-L-R-C for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Yeah, that's uh, bizarre. And, and you know what? That, your is is no stranger to that. I remember back in the day um, being in the theater and watching these big ass rats run across the floor, uh, um, you know, in big cities, where are they going to go? Also, sitting in the courtyard of Paddo's, they have that, um, the half brick walls. And then I, I take my oranges out of the top of my hurricanes and put them on the ledge, and the fucking rats would come out. And this place has got a thousand people in it. They come out, it's like entertainment. They come out and get the orange slices and run back off with them. Let me but, tell you something. When I was living in New York City in the winter, when you are waiting on a subway platform and you look down at the tracks, there are rats everywhere. Like sometimes you look down and yeah. you'll have, you know, 20 within your just your your naked eye view of uh, of the tracks looking down. I mean, it's they are infested down there. It's nasty. It's crazy. Yeah. I, mean, I guess they always have been there, right? That um, rats got to eat too. So. Got to eat. Got to have it. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not eating in that restaurant. No. That's for no. sure. Uh, look, I'm going to bring you all to Alabama. And this is a pretty crazy story because you never hear this. You never think high school band directors have a reason to get stun guns. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna one time you, at band camp. I'm going to tell you. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, an Alabama high school band director was shocked with a stun gun and arrested after Birmingham police said he wouldn't tell his band to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Minor high school band director was arrested after a football game between Minor High and Jackson Olin High School. He's charged with disorderly conduct, harassment, and resisting arrest. Police were trying to clear the stadium at Jackson O'Lynn after the game and asked both bands to stop playing so people wouldn't linger. Police say the Jackson O'Lynn band stopped performing, but that the director disregarded officers and told his students to keep playing. Police officers accompanied by school security guards went to arrest him for disorderly conduct, but he got into a scuffle with it. He said the band director refused to place his hands behind his back and shoved the officer. One of the officers shocked the band director with a stun gun. Paramedics treated the band director and took him to the hospital to be checked out. He was later booked into jail and released after posting bail. Jefferson County School Superintendent Walter Gonlinson said Friday he's gathering facts and declined to further comment for now. He urges everyone not to jump to conclusions. The Birmingham Police Department's Internal Affairs Division investigates all incidents where an officer used force and will be doing so in this incident. And that's something you don't hear every day. Yeah. The band 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 bringing the pain. Yeah, he, look, and it, I mean, that's crazy <laughs> to stun gun this guy <laughs> over the... Because we told you to quit playing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think they, and the, the point was he, he, they told him to put his hands behind his back, and he was like, F you, I'm not doing it. And that's sort of, the, you know, on the use of force continuum, whichever department has, stun guns are right there. If, 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 if you don't want to put your dick beaters on them and, and get in a fist of cuffs, so you, can, you can tase them. And let me tell you something. I tell you, there's a right. bad dude. It's a bad dude. Uh, but shout out to Birmingham PD. Um, uh, 
uh, I can't remember his last name. I, I worked the case with uh, those guys. Um, uh, their lead detective, and y'all know I'm bad with names, but they're pr- pretty cool guys. So, um, pretty good department. But they successfully took uh, down a band director, so they must be good. Well, I mean, you know what? The band director broke the law, and 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 he's not not above <laughs> the law, but. The and they pull you that they show him. So I bet you next time they tell him to put his hands behind his back, he'll do it. And, uh, all right. Yeah. So yeah, always listen to the police. Don't piss off the police. All right. So let's go to Virginia, y'all. This is an interesting case. Um, and two Virginia detectives thought they might be closing in on a suspect in a decades-old cold case killing. Then they got a phone call and said, I want to talk, and I want to talk right now. The person on the line said, according to Fairfax County Police Chief Kevin Davis, it was Stephen Smirk who detectives had talked with earlier that day about the 1994 stabbing death of 37-year-old Robin Lawrence. Smirk wanted to turn himself in, Davis said. And advances in technology led Fairfax Police Department detectives to smirk. They worked with an outside lab that was able to use DNA evidence to identify the suspect's biological relatives and produce a sketch of what the suspect might look like. Authorities then matched Smirk's 1988 yearbook photo and a 1988 DMV photo. Uh, Deputy Chief Eli, Eli Corey said at the Bundy News Conference, two detectives took a trip to Nis- Niskayana, New York, in hopes of furthering their investigation and found Smirk outside his home on September the 7th. When they arrived at Smirk's house, he just happened to be taking his trash out, Corey said. Detectives took the, this opportunity to have a consensual conversation with Smirk, take a DNA swab from him, and leave him their business card. By the end of the day, Smirk called the detectives, turned himself into the local police station, and delivered a full confession in Lawrence's killing. Smirk is facing second-degree murder charge in the case, according to police, and CNN has been unable to determine if Smirk has an attorney. The DNA evidence that led police to Smirk was collected from Lawrence's home in 1994 after the mother was stabbed to death while her two-year-old daughter was left unharmed in another room. Lawrence's body was found after her husband, who was out of the country on a work trip, grew concerned that he hadn't heard from her and asked a family friend to check on her. That friend discovered this heinous and tragic scene. So how about that, y'all? That, uh, I, I wish I would have had all this technology in, back in my day. And, and, and uh, I have the picture of it. Yeah, the, the picture uh it's pretty 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 crazy you know in the decades old stabbing case mm. wow yeah. another one for the good guys this might be a good guy episode yep. right it might be well i don't uh i don't have a good guy to talk about here but we're gonna we're gonna go across the pond and uh talk about something that certainly relates to our efforts with Operation Underground Railroad. This is... Well, well, hey, first, we, we're just going to take up a collection and move your ass across the pond because that's all the stories you do for nowadays. I mean, I know it's your geographical location, but I, I think it would be better if you were there. I, only, I think I only did one story from across the pond today. But uh, but, but this guy, uh, this guy's scam... Uh, it's just easy to see how it could trick young, uh, young women into, uh, uh, into fall and prey. So he's a pervert who posed as a model agency scout on social media. He blackmailed dozens of young girls, some as young as nine years old, into sending explicit photos and videos of themselves. His name is Ishmael Duncan. 24, he was identified by detectives in London after he was found to have contacted thousands of youngsters via fake Snapchat accounts. Those accounts were used to coerce and threaten them into sending those images. Two sisters in the United States reported being threatened after sending 
explicit images to one of those accounts. Following analysis of internet data, cops were able to establish mm -hmm. Duncan, uh, and he was linked to multiple fake Snapchat accounts. A total of 28 female victims were traced from Britain, Canada, and Australia, as well as the U.S., but investigators believe that ultimately he contacted close to 10,000 children online through the accounts. Detectives recovered a total of 19,000 indecent images of children from Duncan's devices and cloud storage. He was arrested in July in his home in Kennington, which is south of London, and those devices were seized. Material recovered from the devices and storage included chat logs from the various Snapchat accounts Duncan used and in indecent images he had extorted from the children. He'd begin by approaching uh, potential victims to ask if they were interested in becoming a model for a well-known fashion brand. Those that responded would be asked for their age and personal details before he requested images or videos. He then took them through a lengthy interview process to build their trust and then sent them legitimate looking contracts which featured the impersonated brand logos. He would then request topless photos on the pretext of assessing the victim's body shape and to use as a base for editing and potential clothes to be modeled. Girls were Girls who questioned him were told the original pictures would be deleted after editing, with some threatened with being blacklisted from modeling if they didn't comply. Duncan contacted victims from several accounts and adopted several different personas within the model agency to give a sense of authenticity, including a photographer called Callum and another one called Mark, who is the general manager of the preteens model division. This guy had his his act down really tight uh, and fooled an awful lot of people with this thing. Uh, Duncan targeted other potential victims by claiming to be a child of a similar age, requesting sexual images and videos. On one occasion, he blackmailed a 14-year-old girl with learning difficulties who sent him images and also offered her $1,000 to engage in a sexual act with her brother. Ultimately, he's been charged with 53 counts, including causing or inciting a child under 13 to engage in sexual activity, blackmail, sexual communication with a child, indecent and prohibited images of a child, and possession of extreme pornography. Uh, he appeared in London Crown Court and uh, pleaded guilty to 42 counts. And I've got a picture of this guy, I mean, young guy, uh, unbelievable. Wow. That's the pond. They, I think they need. I, I think they need the death penalty for the, those kind of people more than they do mass murders, or, or at least as much. Hashtag murder by you, fuck him. And I love y'all very, very much, lifers. I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host, um, going out to do cold case files, uh, um, and talk to y'all later on, right? And and. Much love and peace, boys. Woman from South Korea was allegedly tortured and killed by a gang of at least six people. But this was back in the States. Actually, this occurred in Georgia. So we're doing a multiple country uh, story here. Uh, they lured her to join a group referred to as the Soldiers of Christ. The body of the woman was found dead inside a car in Gwinnett County, Georgia. The woman has not been identified by police. Police last Thursday charged five adults and a teenager with murder, false imprisonment, evidence tampering, and concealing the death of another. Eric Hune, 26, was believed to have parked the car in which the body of the woman was found at a business called Jeju Sauna. He then called a family member to pick him up. He was driven by the family member to Atl an Atlanta area hospital to be treated for unrelated injuries. While at the hospital, he asked a family member to get an item from the car for him. The family member found the dead body in the trunk and called 911. Detectives believe the victim moved to the United States from South Korea sometime back in the summer of this year for the purpose of joining a religious organization. The individuals referred to themselves as belonging to the soldiers of Christ. The victim was apparently subject to beating and malnutrition for weeks. The victim's body weighed 
get this, approximately 70 pounds when discovered by detectives. The the medical examiner's office believes malnourishment could be a contributing factor to her death, you think? The exact cause of death is still under investigation. The victim's family is from South Korea, and detectives believe all suspects are currently in custody and there are no outstanding individuals. Police announced Friday that the detectives have secured multiple criminal street gang warrants against each of the suspects. So it's it's almost like a, a religious cult type thing here. And, and he asked a relative to go out to the car where he had a bot. Yeah. Would, would, you would think he would be a little more careful. <laughs> Just horrible. Uh, and, and must have... You know, it didn't really specify as to whether he said just get something out of the front seat and she happened to look in the trunk, but, uh, uh, you know, goes in the trunk and, and finds this dead body and, and just horrible 70 pounds. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, yeah. let's go to a story from New York that many of you may have seen uh, covered uh, over the beginning coverage over the weekend that started on Saturday and uh, the story has developed further since then. But uh, the cops uh, have removed multiple drugs from a Bronx daycare. Really wasn't a daycare. It was really a, a drug dealer using daycare as a front, but, uh, uh, but a one-year-old died and three other kids were rushed to the hospital after being exposed to or even eating fentanyl. Multiple drugs and supplies were removed from this Bronx daycare where the one-year-old boy died and three others were rushed to the hospital after ingesting fentanyl. Police identified Nicholas Feliz Dominici as the deceased toddler from this horrific tragedy, which unfolded starting Friday afternoon, uh, about 3 o'clock New York time. Police tape had been stripped from the street and hung across the doorway of the Divino Nino Daycare on Morris Avenue, which is in the Kingsbridge neighborhood of the Bronx. The crime scene uh, turned somber as neighbors began to grapple with the devastating loss, and New York Mayor Eric Adams expressed sympathy, having spoken to the mourning parents. Sources with knowledge of the investigation say multiple drugs were found at the daycare, as well as a kilo press, which is used to package large quantities of drugs. Sources also confirmed all four children came in contact with fentanyl. Feliz Dominici, two two two-year-old boys, and an eight-month-old girl were found in the daycare, which sits on the bottom level of the Morris Avenue building. The children had allegedly been put down for naps to be woken up at 2.30 p.m. and had eaten something about 90 minutes earlier. But when the cops arrived at the grim scene, all four were administered with Narcan, one of whom responded to the life-saving drug. According to police, all four were taken to the hospital, but the one-year-old, as we said, did not make it. Three others are now in stable condition. The eight-month-old was also treated for dehydration. The Divino Nino Daycare passed its annual unannounced inspection, which is, I I don't know how they could have been running a big drug operation behind there and actually had an unannounced inspection that they passed. But on September 6th, they passed a supposedly unannounced inspection with zero violations. The daycare has a capacity of eight children. Again, not much of a daycare. Capacity of eight children between the ages of six weeks and 12 years old, according to records. One of the women believed to run the daycare has been taken into custody. You've probably seen that in the pictures. Uh, Mayor Adams expressed sympathy for the family, sharing that he'd spoken to the parents who lost their son. Uh, At his press conference over the weekend, he said the event should act as a warning for people with opioids in their homes. To see the pain they're experiencing is something that all of us New Yorkers are experiencing and all of us that are parents. The crisis is real, and it's a real wake-up call for individuals who have opioids or fentanyl in their homes. Uh, Arrests have been made, and we are awaiting more charges. He said, I believe one additional arrest has been made at this point. But 
you know, I'm, I'm sort of fixated on this inspection. I don't know how they could have passed an inspection earlier this month. That sounds really fishy. And we got a one-year-old that's dead and three others that, uh, that barely made it. Sounds like it may have been a payoff along the line somewhere with the inspector. Uh, yeah, I don't see how they mess that either. And, and fentanyl continuing to be a problem. One of the, you know, we've talked about it a lot on this show. You, you, you touch up just a cr- crumb of fentanyl and it'll kill you. So, uh, um, these people horrible, obviously horrible do not care. Yeah, they don't. Uh, well, it is mile high crime time and this is mile high crimes for Thursday. And we're going to tell you, you know, Mike, one of the problems that continues to be an issue, but when I give you the stat from this year to probably blow you and everybody else's mind is people bringing loaded guns to the airport. Uh, you would think by now people know you can't bring a loaded gun to the airport and you would especially think that if you worked for the airport. So a flight attendant was actually stopped from boarding a plane with a loaded gun at the Philadelphia International Airport. The woman unsuccessfully tried passing through airport security checkpoints with a 380 caliber handgun before working a flight. After TSA officers found the weapon, police arrested that flight attendant. She's also facing a federal financial penalty. It's well known publicly that passengers are not permitted to carry firearms through our security checkpoints. This from the TSA security director for the airport. But it's equally important that the public is aware that individuals who work at the airport are not permitted to be in possession of a gun. We are equally focused on screening employees as well as travelers, they went on to say. If someone is found with a loaded Air, uh, firearm at an airport checkpoint or aboard a flight, they can be fined up to $10,700 and face criminal referral. One day after the flight attendant was found with a gun, a North Carolina man was caught with a loaded handgun at the same airport. Uh, and as of September 17th, 31 guns have been found at the Philadelphia airport TSA oh checkpoint. God. 31 guns. Three weeks ago at the same airport, a man who works at one of the retail shops yeah, and he actually that. brought you this yeah. story was found with a gun. Yeah. So he told officers he forgot to remove that gun from his carry on bag after visiting a shooting range. Now, nationwide, the message of not bringing a gun to a handgun to an airport seems to also be an issue from January 1st to June 30th. Get ready for this. 3,251 firearms were found by TSA officers at security checkpoints. Oh, my God. Well, (laughs) that's that's crazy. That's crazy. But a flight attendant? I mean, a flight – like, I get – the the story of the guy who worked in retail who was at a shooting range before who forgot that he left the – okay, that's all – you can believe that one. Right. That's an accident that could easily happen. How does a flight attendant try and get through security with a gun? And why they if anybody would know that's not going to happen, it would be a flight attendant. I mean, it would be somebody that works. And and how many flights does this person take a week? Was there a response? And you're going to try to the flight attendant have some kind of rationale? Uh, there was no comment <laughs> that I saw. I don't think she could come up with something good enough or he um, could come up with something good enough on that, on that scenario to, to have it make sense. Just stupidity. Um, and as to why, no, they haven't said as of yet. Absolutely bizarre. Yeah. Plus number for half a year. I mean, 6,000 a year that I just, is crazy. And this ain't, you know, sneaking one. These are people you go through. All of us have flown. You go through the checkpoint. <laughs> oh, I, I forgot I had that in my pants. <laughs> 
Yeah. Wow. Hey, ladies, are you feeling overwhelmed by hormonal changes? Well, you're definitely not alone. There are more than 1,000 hormone disruptors living in our environment right now. It's sending your food, your water, the air you breathe, the clothes you wear, your skincare products. They all mess with your hormones. Then there's the natural hormone changes your body goes through. Premenopause, menopause. And while it's a natural process, it doesn't mean you have to suffer through it. The good news is you don't have to suffer through it anymore because now you have Hormone Harmony, a formula made only with herbal ingredients that are shown to reduce hormonal symptoms in women of all ages. Hormone Harmony is not just a hormone support and supplement. It's become a phenomenon. Women can't stop talking about it on social media. A bottle of Hormone Harmony is sold every 24 seconds. And the biggest benefit? Well, my wife says it makes her feel like her own self again. And that's what women mention over and over in the reviews. And there are over 30,000 reviews for Hormone Harmony. And for a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use code RLRC at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use code RLRC for 15% off today. That's H-A-P-P-Y-M-A-M-M-O-T-H dot com and use code R-L-R-C. Hey, y'all. Let me tell you about Gobble. All Gobble Meal Kits are pre-prepped. That means less work for you and less waste in your kitchen. Their meal kits include everything you need so you can save time at the store or just skip that trip entirely. I got the box in and I had three different meals. I had a Kung Pao chicken, crispy fish tacos, and a beef boom jignon. However you say it, but let me tell you about the classic beef boom jignon. Look, it came with beef pot roast and a beef broth concentrate, red wine demi glaze, cremini mushrooms, ciapelloni onions, mashed potatoes, baby carrots, and rosemary thyme butter. It was so easy to make. Literally like 15 minutes it took Cindy. And let me tell you something, all the dishes were fire. But this thing was like a taste explosion in my mouth. It's just un real. We've got to spend more time together and more time doing the things we love because everything came in this one single box right to my door. So see what a difference Gobble will make for your household. Right now, they're offering my listeners a fantastic limited time deal. You get $120 off across four boxes plus free shipping and free cookies. And let me tell you, those cookies, I ate one that was sin baked and it was delicious. Go to gobble.com slash real life. That's G-O-B-B-L-E dot com forward slash real life for $120 off your first four boxes. This offer is not available on the home site, so don't miss out. This is genius. It's taste explosions in your mouth like you never had. Bizarre. Well, uh, if we had uh, if we had a banjo and some fiddles playing, uh, I would uh, I would tell you we're going to find another stupid gun story here in our dumb criminal segment because we have an Indiana man that's facing felony charges, but he's facing the felony charges after he was shot in the back by his two-year-old son who found his gun laying on his bed. Justin T. Ah. Wiley, 32, of Fort Wayne, Indiana, was charged this week with neglect of a dependent resulting in serious bodily injury and unlawful possession of a handgun. He is not legally allowed to carry a gun because of prior felony convictions. Fort Wayne police officers found Wiley on September 9th suffering from a gunshot wound in his middle to upper back. He was shot in the home of a woman who had an active protection order against him. Wiley told police he put his gun down on the bed before the two-year-old boy grabbed it and pulled the trigger. The woman told officers she heard the gunshot Mm. and then heard Wiley yell, he shot me. The child had... uh, Uh, had injuries to his gunpowder-marked right pointer finger, including swelling and blistering, and he repeatedly said, owie, while looking at his finger, according 
to officers. Wiley was released on bond, uh, but is officially a double dumbass criminal. He's he's carrying a gun when he's not allowed to, and then he's putting it down on a bed and allowing a two year old to shoot him in the back. I guess her kid didn't like him very much since that wasn't actually his son. Right. That, that's a smart two year old. Yeah, uh, figured out that guy was a dumb criminal probably before the general. Well, what an insult getting having uh, getting charged with a crime, right? <laughs> that so. Uh, Wait, what, yeah. was the, what was the charge again? It's uh, neg- ne- neglect of a dependent resulting in serious bodily injury. Getting charged with a crime involving serious bodily injury when the bodily injury happens to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, you're, you know, he's going to be in jail. And what are you in for? And, you know, a yeah. two-year-old <laughs> shot me. I mean, that's not a very manly story to tell in the holding cell. For sure. Well, you have you have to wow. admit that little Dumb brat. I mean, maybe you can embellish a little bit on how big a brat. Can be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'd be admitting to that for sure. Wow, what an idiot! Uh, and I wish we had some banjos to play you out of that one. That was a good one. Uh, you know, now we're going to bring you back. We 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 haven't done this segment in a little while, and that's they stole, they stole what? what? And you know, there's some bizarre. When I tell y'all this one. It's going to really blow your mind. A Virginia woman is still shaken up after a man stole a package as it was being delivered right in front of her home. It was during the day. It could have been worse, but it's getting out of control. This from Jessica Sands, who was the Virginia uh, homeowner. Sands said last Thursday, as she was working from, from home, her FedEx delivery driver knocked on her door frantically but not because she needed her signature. She was crying. And then she said, can you open the door? Someone stole your package. Sands said she called police and looked at a ring camera to see a man pacing step by step with the FedEx worker and snatched the package as soon as she got to Sands' front steps. The man then runs to a BMW parked out in front as the worker runs to her car to grab her phone. It was unbelievable because it was right outside my house and this guy could have broken in and taken it from me, Sand said. Sand said she's been living in her home for two years and has never had an issue with packages being stolen. I get packages here every day. Even that day, five minutes before that lady showed up, I had three packages arrive from Amazon and no one was here. She feels this was not random, and the person somehow knew the contents of the package, which was a $1,600 iPad for her husband's work. This this was a valuable package that needed a signature, so for some reason, these guys knew it was something of high value. The delivery driver told police she was walking up. The The man claimed the package was his before snatching it. Sands said the delivery driver was shaken up, but was able to grab the temporary plate numbers on the BMW. So she said that the she was told the plates were used a month earlier and were associated with another theft. My thing is these porch pirates are getting really bold now. You would think with the extra surveillance people have, ring cameras and all that, it would slow down the package valves. But now, Mike, they're snatching them right from the delivery drivers. Well, hands. and that makes that makes right a lot of, of sense hands. because they're uh, correctly assuming that Amazon is training their employees not to resist if somebody comes up and tries to do that. And so, it would make a lot of sense that they might start following around trucks and just doing that. But this sounds like some kind of inside job because. Chances are you do something like that. If it's just random, you know, you're going to get a $20 package or a $30 value package. You're not going to land a, you know, $1,600 uh, MacBook each time. So it sounds like maybe somebody knew something there. It's, it's possible. And, and, uh, you know, it, it I actually have the video that that I'll post on the social media for everybody to see. It, it's just so bold. I mean, walks 
right next to this driver and just yanks it and takes off. And the second incident in which those plates were used. So, um, you know, post office employees, Amazon employees, whatever. I mean, everybody's got to be on the lookout. Now these porch pirates aren't just waiting for it to be sitting in a front yard yeah, now, with no one there. I mean, they're I wonder right what happened to where they already had that plate once and weren't for some reason able to locate the vehicle. In the, in the own. I think stolen it was, a, plate. I think it was a stolen plate. Yeah. It, it was just a stolen plate, which, you know, has been a problem forever. I mean, it's not hard to, you pull into Walmart and unscrew yeah. someone's plate and you're gone in two seconds. And you know, it's a, a quick, easy thing. Uh, but yeah, I believe it was a stolen plate. They haven't been able to. Well, if tie they're, it to if they're wearing a hoodie, so. they've got their, their face uh, protected. Then the ring cameras aren't going to help. And if they've got a stolen plate on a, on a getaway car, then it, you got to catch them in the act. Probably. That's right. That's right. And, uh, so that was your they stole what they Amazon stole packages what? Uh, today. They stole what? And uh, and Mike, we do want to shout out. Um, uh, we've had look what great fans we have that that they donate of their own. Uh, I guess recourse for uh, human trafficking, uh, specifically child trafficking. Uh, we've had a lot of response to the you know, little egg challenge. Yeah, they're mostly great human uh, beings in there. Great idea you had there. Plus. There are some questionable human beings who clearly just want to see eggs cracked on my head, <laughs> but we won't mention anyone by name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, what a great what a great idea, and we have far surpassed you know uh, uh, the original. Uh, I guess monetary egg cracking goal that we set, but uh, we're not stopping there. It's still, it's no, the, still the open mud wrestling and, tally and, uh, is still, is still out anyone. there. We um, we'll figure out in the next yeah. few days, folks, the day that makes the most sense for us to do that. Obviously, with Woody gone this week, that wouldn't have made sense. So maybe next week or the week after, we'll figure it out. That's right. Sounds perfect, and uh, and I, I guess that's all we got. You got any final thoughts? Just thinking about my Giants tonight. Gonna need a miracle. <laughs> You're gonna need a miracle. Well, they yeah they maybe gonna they'll, need a second, you know, your most important is from game one to game two. Yeah, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to watch anyway. That's for sure, and. Until next time, I'm Jim Chapman. I'm Woody Overton. That's how we always do. I'm that wasn't Woody even Overton. close, Mike. And I'm Mike Agavino. <laughs> For real life, real crime daily. Peace. Peace.